Here we are at my favorite part of the United States Pony Club annual meeting, and that's the anatomy lab. Here's my good friend, Dr. Brad Gordon. Brad and I, have we were just uh, reminiscing, and we go back, gosh, to about 1974 at a national rally when we were both competing as A's. Brad, how are you this morning? Very good, thank you. Good to see you, buddy. Great. And um, tell us, how, how did this brainchild of the anatomy lab begin? Uh, several annual meetings ago, they had uh, different people put on anatomy labs, and we started in the Kansas City annual meeting, and we've been doing it since then. Great. Uh, so, then this has been, how many years then is that? This is our fifth year, and we're looking forward to next year's meeting in Nashville. Ter terrific. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Brad, and your background. I was a graduate of Bath Pony Club, uh, graduate A, and worked up through the ranks and examinations and doing um, all types of horse management judging, national judging, and do teaching. And you were a vet. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Um, in an equine practice in Des Moines, Iowa, and we do some uh, circus animal work, but 99% horses. That's terrific. That's right up your alley. So I think we need to take a little bit of a look here and see what we've got. Um, oh, my gosh. What's that? Uh, this is a head from a horse that died of colic that we cut in half, and we use this to show uh, the pony clubbers that as we pull the tongue back, they can see that the upper jaw is wider than the lower jaw, and because of that, as the horse eats and grinds its food, we get points on the inside of the lower teeth and the outside of the upper teeth. We also use this to illustrate the turbinates, the scrolls of bone in the horse's nose that are very rich in blood supply and it's the horse's radiator system. So as air comes in and flows across these scrolls of bones, the horses that are breathing very shallow and rapidly end up cooling themselves because the blood flows through and comes in close contact with the cooling air. Uh, we have part of the upper airway here and we use this to demonstrate right here where we have the guttural pouch opening and one can see that there actually is a pouch that can accumulate bacteria and pus and cause chronic respiratory problems. Also we have the upper airway opening right here where we have the larynx and we can show the flappers and the epiglottis and how the soft palate is below the epiglottis and that's why horses can't breathe through their mouths. We have the brain right here and we can see it's about the size of our fist. And here we have a dissected out model of the throat so we can see the tongue is cut in half here. This is the top of the soft palate and it does in fact stay underneath the epiglottis so that's why horses can't mouth breathe but yet people, dogs and cats can. And when horses go to swallow food these flappers close, this epiglottis flips up over it, and then the food goes down the esophagus, which we have right here, and goes down to the stomach. Fascinating. So the, I'm sure the kids really enjoy getting to learn about this firsthand. Did anybody ever get squeamish? Sometimes in the past we've had very young pony clubbers that will come in and get squeamish, and they'll go out and a day or so later they'll come back and they'll look at things, and then we've had several that will come back the second year, and they've been very excited to put on gloves and dive right in. Cool. So uh, how are these, these specimens that we've just seen, how are they preserved? Uh, they were preserved originally with formaldehyde, then they were washed for a couple of weeks, and they're put in a polypropylene glycol solution, and then they're washed again for about a week before they come, and they're kept in water here, and that's why we're able to touch them without gloves on, although the pony clubbers use gloves when they handle them. Because it, it really, it really um, doesn't smell particularly no. offensive, so I'm, I'm very impressed with that. Uh, the hotels make sure that we have uh, specimen-friendly exhibits. Oh, I bet they would. What is next on the table here? Um, at this end we have uh, seven vertebrae in the spine and we use that to show the cervical nature of the nerve roots and how horses can have problems with their necks that can affect lameness in the front and rear of the body. At the other end of the table we have um, Look her down there. the head and we show how the Upper jaw is wider than the lower jaw, and so when the horses grind their food, they get the points on the outside of the upper, inside of the lower. We talk about ramp formation and how in horses that have the front part of their teeth worked on but not the back, we can get ramps in the lower part of the back part of the lower jaw, and that will drive the lower jaw back, upper jaw forward, and we end up with TMJ pain. 
we look at wolf teeth, and, and many people think that the canine teeth are where the wolf teeth are located, and actually the wolf teeth are remnants of the first premolars, and when they exist, they're right in front of the first cheek tooth that we see. And we also talk about how the teeth continually erupt as the horses grow older, and so if we have young horses and we have to take teeth out and punch them out, we have to make holes pretty high up along the side of the head, but as the teeth continue to erupt, the roots get smaller and smaller, so as they get older, sometimes we don't have to punch those teeth out, we can actually extract them. Terrific, fascinating. What is this larger round stone? This was a salivary duct stone that we took out of a horse and it had been in the side of the face and it grew very slowly, was non-painful and it got to the point where it would interfere with the bridling of the horse and so then it was taken out surgically and we just used this to show an example of the salivary uh, stone and its concentric rings of calcium and farther along we have bladder stones and intestinal stones that have come out and we just use this to contrast with those. Terrific. How about if we move on down the line here? Cindy's with Margot Leithhead and they're looking at a uh, horse heart, the average size of a heart for a thousand pound horse. And Cindy can discuss that. Let, let me stop right now and introduce Cindy. This is Cindy Healy. Cindy is also a friend of mine. Cindy has organized some testings that I have uh, done in her region. And we were roommates at one national meeting. It was really terrific. And Ms. Margot Leithhead, who is a former president of the United States Pony Club, and she has also been a friend since, since I was a girl. <laughs> These are lifelong friends of mine, if you can't tell. So, Cindy, what have we here? Well, this is a horse head that came from an 1,100, 1,200-pound yearling thoroughbred that they had. It was a long yearling. They were taking it to the track, and she broke her leg. Oh, okay. and so we had permission to take the parts. It was from a, a barn that's attached to our clinic. And so we harvested several parts from her. And the, as you can see, it's you know, a lot bigger than what most people think. In fact, the first year I pulled the heart out at an annual meeting, one woman thought that it was swollen because of the water. And you go, no, oh, this is really the size. Okay. That is it huge. Really it's huge. absolutely huge. It does have a big heart. Yes, they do. How, what, what, what is this heart this weigh? This heart weighs nine and a half pounds. And they do get larger, and I understand they say unofficially that Secretariat's heart weighed 24 pounds. Oh, but wow. But I don't think they, I think that's just, you know, that isn't documented because they weren't doing it at that time. So, but it's a four-chambered heart just like for us.